so much for the introduction and uh, we're really honored to be with all of you today. Uh, I've had the opportunity to listen to uh, a bunch of the presentations throughout uh, the last two days and it's really inspiring to see all the advances um, in the field and um, you know we'll share a bit about ourselves today but um, just a virtual standing ovation to Pramila and the Brain Foundation. This has been uh, an exceptional uh, symposium and uh, we'll share uh, some of our contributions to the science. Uh, I'll start by uh, introducing our disclosures. Uh, Alex, who's to my right, and, and myself are employees and minority shareholders of Wade Neuroscience, but we will uh, just present the science and the data and avoid uh, commercial bias. We have uh, numerous uh, funding resources, um, which we'll touch on uh, in a moment. And then Dr. Mason Harrell uh, will also present um, his experience uh, he has a daughter with uh, Kleefer syndrome. This is an autistic, uh, a genetic form of autism uh, with some unique characteristics. He has a, a unique perspective as well as both a physician, a scientist who's a triple board certified. Um, so we'll launch right into it. Um, part of the reason you're seeing this intermingling of uh, military approaches, special operations, and then autism, it left me scratching my head at first glance, but. Uh, this technology was really engineered and innovated uh, to help the brain function better and more efficiently as an organ. And when we use that as our end goal, we can touch many different uh, conditions and diagnoses. Uh, we're very careful to say this is not a panacea uh, or a cure for any of these conditions. It's not even disease modifying, uh, but we're seeing some significant and promising data as it relates to uh, a number of different um, uh, symptom clusters, and uh, as it relates to developmental delay, uh, we're seeing some encouraging results. Uh, so uh, the military's interest is in human performance and optimization, um, and uh, this can be applied across a number of different um, platforms. And so we have a wonderful team, uh, proud to um, work with all these individuals, uh, scientists, uh, engineers, physicians, uh, all uh, getting together with a common goal and purpose. Uh, we also have a deep bench of advisors and consultants, um, some, some that you may recognize, but all uh, both wonderful people who are purpose-driven and have really advanced the science for us. Uh, so feel very privileged to be working with all of them. Hey, uh, excuse me, Eric, I don't think your slides are changing. I'm, I'm not seeing them change here. You're st I'm still seeing the title slide. Um, are you in slideshow mode? I am, but let me, let me try uh, redoing that. this will work. Oh. When you share your screen, share on as well. That was working there, Eric. All um, right, let me try that again. Okay. The try before work. Oh, there we go. It's good. That's, thank oh. you. Sure. Um, so uh, this is uh, a, a bit about our uh, platform. Uh, this is our team. And um, here, here are our consultants. And so I know uh, we ran through those relatively quickly. Uh, we can make these slides available if people are interested in uh, reviewing in more depth. Um, but in the interest of time, I, I've, I've been advised we're, we're running a bit behind. Uh, this is our process. We first get a brainwave recording. Many of you may be familiar with quantitative EEG. It's a brain mapping technology. Uh, Alex is gonna to speak to that in much greater length momentarily. Uh, we run this through neurocomputational analytics and a normative database and come up with a, a report. Uh, this has been transformed from what used to be a 30 page report into uh, a one pager that is intended to be much easier to understand taking some very complex neuroscience and distilling it into uh, more easily interpretable biometrics. And then we're stimulating uh, the brain using an FDA grade uh, class two medical device. Um, it's called transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, but we're individualizing and personalizing protocols unique to each individual. And then we can create a virtuous loop of doing these EEG scans every couple of weeks, uh, and then ensuring that we're achieving the progress uh, objectively and, and scientifically. We're very proud of our research partners. Uh, we've invested quite a bit of resources, time and energy uh, into validating the results that we're seeing. Uh, this is a partial list, but we're uh, embarking on even more uh, studies in 2022. Um, 
moving to larger sample sizes and outside of uh, just pilot data. And I'll turn it over to Alex to talk a bit more about uh, our EEG science relative to autism. Thank you, All right, so uh, heading over to what uh, Dr. Juan just covered, uh, an EEG is a measurement of uh, cortical uh, electrical activity. Uh, it's, uh, it could be taken during eyes open or eyes closed states, it could be taken when someone's awake or asleep, and there are different frequencies of activity that are generally expected during these different stages of uh, alertness or, or sleep, eyes open, eyes closed. And when you start looking at uh, subjects who've been diagnosed with autism or uh, developmental delay, developmental disorders, there are common um, endophenotypes or features uh, that reveal disconnective uh, features in this EEG. So um, there are features, as you can see here on the left, this is looking at default mode network function, which uh, is generally a reflective network and occurs during eyes closed waking states. Um, we see um, when we compare this as well against normative controls that there are differences. And I'm gonna focus on that on the next slide as well. Um, here's a comparison. Uh, on the left, it's typically developing controls versus autism uh, confirmed uh, children. And you can see that uh, there are these darker lines that progress from left to right of the screen, uh, going from 30, 60, 90 to 120 months, up to 10 years of age. Uh, and we can see that uh, this, the x-axis is frequency for eyes closed resting EEG. And everyone starts with a, a frequency approximately uh, below eight, but you can see typically developing children around 30 months have a, a dominant brainwave frequency of about eight hertz or eight oscillations or brainwave oscillations per second. That progresses up to about 10 to 11 by, by about uh, 90 to 120 months. And when we're comparing that against autism, what we can see here is that frequency maxes out at about nine to 10 hertz. So there's a frequency component here that's um, intrinsically um, underdeveloped when we're looking at, at children with ASD. And, and this component is something that's important to recognize and understand because when it comes to alpha activity, this has been demonstrated to be reflective of our uh, sampling frequency, essentially the number of pieces of information uh, we're taking per second. It's uh, explained by Nyquist's role of frequency sampling, but um, the faster the frequency, uh, the faster generally our, our uh, sensory perceptive rhythm is. So this is one of the components that we find is generally reported in literature as disrupted in autism. Another component is something called coherence, and coherence is how well connected the brain is, uh, given the different frequency bands I uh, referred to earlier. You have slower frequency activities, theta, uh, and delta, and these generally occur during, during stage one sleep or deeper periods of sleep, and, and then waking rhythms, uh, eyes closed being some this, this alpha rhythm, and then eyes open being beta. And fairly reliably, what's found is that this alpha rhythm, in addition to being slower um, in its expected frequency, it's also uh, less connected in, in general, especially uh, between anterior and posterior cortical regions. That is, it tends to be hyperconnected posteriorly, and there's underconnectivity between posterior and anterior regions. So you might have uh, excess of alpha activity in posterior regions of um, eyes closed resting EEG, but you'll see that it's, it's quite uh, underdeveloped in front of central regions. This has been uh, confirmed and reconfirmed with multiple studies. Here's a, a, a connectome. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, the uh, EEG locations, uh, the posterior locations are on the right side uh, on, near the bottom, and the anterior locations are up top near the left, and, and red are areas that are overconnected, and blue are areas that are uh, underconnected. You can see that there's, as a consequence, underconnectivity frontally and overconnectivity posteriorly. So this is something that's been well recognized and published in literature, and um, it corresponds well with the symptom profiles that are generally observed in ASD. So we take advantage of, of this insight and uh, for every uh, subject, every patient who comes through, um, we take a look at their EEG and uh, try to reduce this, this various information, which you know, can be very overwhelming to someone who doesn't have any background in EEG and simplify it uh, to a, a picture here. And you can see this picture is uh, has posterior central and frontal labeled on it. And we have something called the Fourier transform here, where on the left side of the screen would be the raw signal, and we're simulating it here in frontal and posterior regions. 
If we count the number of oscillations per second, and let's say there are 10 oscillations per second, then we'll be able to see on our FFT um, a peak at 10. Um, similarly, if there are nine oscillations per second, our FFT will demonstrate a peak at nine. If there are 12, a peak at 12. If both nine and 12, a peak at both nine and 12. So we can get from this a frequency component and also an amplitude component for the EEG duration that we're recording. And we tend to see this for 10 minute eyes closed EEGs. And what we see on the right is uh, for uh, typically developing uh, adult or, um, or child uh, dominant uh, posterior rhythm at about 10 to 11 hertz. You can see that peak there. And then the same corresponding frequency in central and frontal regions. The peak uh, is sharp, which tells us that there's no other activities occurring. We don't see peaks slower off to the left or faster and off to the right, neither theta or beta frequency ranges. Now, when we take this test and we start looking at our uh, children who, who might be coming in with, with ASD diagnoses, we start to uh, notice fairly uh, profound uh, changes or differences rather in just resting eyes closed function. Here we see uh, highlighted in red on the right, the alpha uh, frequency band for a child with autism. We can see that there's a frequency of about, let's say nine and a half Hertz in posterior. And we look at frontal and central, there's a corresponding alpha activity at about 10, but it's not the largest EG rhythm in the FFT spectrum. We can see there's also activity off to the left in this theta range. And as a consequence, the amplitude of alpha activity in the frontal uh, low it could preferably be higher. So we take this information and uh, we then uh, utilize it with neuromodulation in order to try to get the EEG that's on the right uh, to shift and, and look more like the EEG on the left through um, entrainment of cortical tissue. So uh, the technology referred to earlier, this RTMS, we call it magnetic EEG, EKG resonant therapy, we, we calculate this biometric frequency from this F of T and then provide that frequency of stimulation into cortical tissue uh, correspondent to the frequency that we're visualizing with this, with this F of T tool. So I'm gonna hand it back to uh, Dr. Wan in order to look through a couple of cases. Thanks, Alex. Um, so this is a case that's kind of near and dear to my heart. It was uh, one of my introductions to the technology. At the time I came across this, I was actually um, at the Boeing company, most no Fortune 50 aerospace company. Uh, I was playing a role as their chief physician and a secondary role as their technology officer for health services. And uh, one of my neighbor's children uh, who had a fairly significant autism had shared with me a, a bit about the technology. And you can see some of the history here at that time, uh, a six-year-old uh, male who was born prematurely um, there's some more details there, and up until 18 months, uh, was really thriving, met all of his milestones, was babbling, uh, crawling, used words, um, and then around 18 months, uh, there were um, some lost milestones, and he stopped responding to his name, he lost his words and language, uh, began stemming, uh, doing hand flapping, uh, all of his tests actually for quite a while uh, was coming back normal, uh, his pediatrician had actually provided quite a bit of reassurance, but uh, over time, they started uh, him in ABA therapy and speech therapy uh, until he eventually uh, came in for treatment. And this is his EEG uh, upon arrival. And you can see, uh, as Allison mentioned, there is a deficit, uh, if not absence, of alpha activity in the frontal and central regions, uh, but the peak in the posterior region where there's hyperconnectivity. Uh, and this morning, I heard some talks about the MFTC. Uh, gene and um, imbalance of excitatory and inhibitory uh, neuron development, it uh, actually got me really interested because we're seeing some convergence of scientific disciplines here. And if, if we're of the belief, uh, as Alex and I are, that science always converges on the truth, um, a lot of these dots are really starting to connect for us. But this uh, EEG was taken two weeks after a treatment, and you can start to see emerging uh, some alpha peaks in the frontal and central regions. And that was corroborated by many of his behavioral uh, symptoms, the, the behaviors that had improved, uh, in some cases, quite profoundly over time. And so we could see within two weeks, he was calmer, uh, was starting to improve his comprehension. Um, he was starting to imitate um, uh, the children around him instead of aunt's name for the first time. Um, and then fortunately, as with many of our patients, he came back in a year. Uh, and we're very encouraged to see that he continued to make progress. 
And it's important to note, this progress was made without treatments. It's, it seems to us that once we start to activate these neurons and those neural networks uh, start to light up, uh, the body does much of the work for us. And this is true to, I think, many of our medical paradigms uh, that uh, we tend to be born and engineered as healing organisms. Uh, if you put two ends of a wound martian together, it heals. Two ends of a broken bone together, it'll heal. It seems to us that with brain activity, if you move it in the right direction, uh, the trajectory of that improvement tends to improve with time as well. So this child came back uh, for treatment several years in a row. Uh, hopefully this video will include audio, but this is a before and after video of this child that the family's given me consent to share this. Um, hopefully this will play. And then they had to go, they went on vacation, they went somewhere. Okay, I'm going to get it. Um, and if we do miss one or if he moves too much, we usually just add another one to the end. Oh, that's not a T, it's a D. Kid. 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 Good boy. Rat, good boy. Good boy. So before I turn it over to Alice, I should mention not every child has this uh, kind of progress, but we're really encouraged um, by his, his change. And it, it was part of what compelled me uh, to move over to join this organization. And um, he is now uh, much older, obviously, uh, but he no longer requires IEPs. He's at grade level um, and uh, is making friends and uh, has done quite well. Uh, so let me turn it over to Alex to share a bit more about some of the work that we've done. So uh, I'll, I'll show another uh, case uh, report right here, and we're going to go ahead and launch into some of the chart reviews that have been performed. I just wanted to note that for the, the therapy, um, we measure individual alpha frequencies, which are very person to person. So we task the RTMS device to match with the, the frequency that we're measuring in the EEG, and one person might receive stimulation nine hertz or uh, nine times per second, or another one might receive it 11 times per second. And these are daily 30 minute sessions where stimulation is applied um, over the course of uh, Monday through Friday, generally five days a week, and then EEGs are taken serially, as, as was mentioned earlier. Here are uh, twins, uh, identical twins, and you can see. This, uh, this line here, February 15, February 17, this is the baseline for, for the identical twins. And uh, their EEGs look, look a little different, um, even the, and, and their sever the severity of their disorder was also similar but different. And we can see from left to right, the general and gradual formation of a peak for the top at about 10 and a half hertz. And, and for the bottom case from left to right, a gradual development in this, this rhythm uh, also at about 10, although, uh, this this case on the, on the bottom far right has a peak also posteriorly at about eight. So uh, when it comes to uh, you know, cortical uh, tissue and uh, network function, it, it's different person to person. But following one month of therapy for, for both uh, cases, they reported improvements in cognition. Attention and language was very exciting for the family. So we've been uh, seeing this uh, for, for many uh, years now, uh, application of the technology. And uh, there are a couple of studies and chart reviews that have been performed on, on the populations that have gone through this. This was uh, one of the first ones back in 2014 and end of 26 that followed up uh, children went through clinic that received this for a um, mean of 24 month period of time after the period when they received the uh, and underwent the, the therapy. And uh, it was uh, 26 uh, cases who had a baseline CAR score, childhood autism rating scale. I believe this audience understands that score. Severe is, um, I believe, 40. Uh, well, 40 plus is, is where we get moderate, and severe is 40. Uh, it's a bit higher. Uh, but started off with a CAR score of 41, and uh, by the end, at the end of two years, had an average CAR's improvement of uh, or reduction in 11.7 points, which, which was uh, quite profound and impactful. Uh, to note the cutoff score for some of these, uh, you know, some perspectives is between 28 and 30 per cars. But, um, you know, this is just the initial look of in clinic intervention. Uh, we 
more recently took a look at uh, subjects who've received 20 or sorry, 40 sessions over the course of, of two months of um, consistent uh, therapy. And uh, you can see here a baseline CAR score. This is an N of 167 taken from a, a couple of clinics who were uh, providing this therapy, a baseline score here of about 39.1. And then over the course of the two months, uh, quite an impressive reduction uh, down to an average or, or mean of 33.9. Uh, we went ahead and, and further stratified by baseline severity just to take a look and see you know, who would be most uh, benefiting from um, this type of uh, intervention, at least in, in this clinical setting. And what we were uh, you know, excited to see is those who were most severe had the greatest proportion of reduction uh, and those who were near the bottom, uh, you know, they, they didn't uh, improve as much. And uh, you know, we can see from this that symptom severity was in, in some way correspondent to the degree of, of, of change over the course of time. Uh, this technology we're seeing uh, applied not only in the States, but, but in other countries. Uh, an Australia group recently uh, went through, and this is uh, in, in progress for publication right here, uh, and, and looked at, uh, at uh, let's see, 12 uh, uh, subjects as they received uh, stimulation over the course of uh, approximately a month, and, and they found uh, BCS and PCS before and, and, and after stimulation that there was uh, quite a few domains on the CARs. You can see the subdomains on the right that changed uh, dramatically, adaptation to change being one of them. Um, and then taste, tell, taste, smell, touch, use, and response, and then fear and nervousness. So there were a couple of domains that were more responsive at least, but we're uh, excited to see that this is having an impact in multiple domains um, and not only on populations in the States. And just to kind of uh, bring back to what we're seeing on the, the scientific level, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to interact with and uh, provide neuromodulation to cortical networks. And, uh, you know, autism is essentially thought of as a, a disorders, uh, a spectrum disorder where there may be different types of uh, uh, real diagnosis hidden in, in there. And just to highlight that, Phelan McDermott and Thistra syndrome are also considered to be uh, subtypes of autism or have a population uh, percentage that, that also have autism. We're finding and, and seeing that there's a similar uh, change in, in networks when we're providing neuromodulation to these networks and, and to, to these subgroups. I'm going to hand it over to Mason Harrell, who has a uh, uh, point of discussion on, on Thistra syndrome. Uh, Mason, if, if you're there, go ahead. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, everybody can hear me okay? Yep. Good. Yeah. yeah so um, I'm a physician, as was mentioned before, um, and um, as, as a physician, have a different, little bit different perspective and experience with a child with severe disabilities and autism. And I really appreciate um, being able to be invited just to speak for just a couple of minutes here um, to all of you. And I appreciate all of your work um, that you all are doing in this field. It affects our lives in ways that uh, all of you know or can imagine. Um, so Eleanor, uh, our three and a half year old today, um, we found out she had Kleefscher syndrome at age one. Uh, she was, uh, she uh, is the light of my life. And, and as you can see that smile, yeah, it can kill, it can stop you in your tracks. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the best thing that I can say probably in my experience as a, as a scientist and as a skeptic in general is that Eleanor went through a period of time where she really started a new trajectory of, um, of progression, uh, of development. And that's the first time that happened. That's when she started walking. When she started walking, there was just a brain developmental um, increase in trajectory. And the second time that happened was when um, she went through transcranial magnetic stimulation. And it, it wasn't, you know, within the first week, it was actually probably around the four week, six week, eight week mark, where uh, not just us, we started noticing it, but our therapists were blinded. They didn't know this was going on. And they started saying, whoa, something's changing in Eleanor. And it was really exciting. And they, it was just like when she started walking, um, where the trajectory changed. Specifically, we saw that, or we experienced that Eleanor's um, cognition speed, just the, 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 how fast she could process information, um, made a significant increase. Um, 
she was speaking back then uh, a dog was a was a d and then that was it um and uh and during that time she started closing words um so she went to say dog and uh instead of d, d for dad it was dad um really neat um and then the other one was attention she was just paying she started paying attention more um and and um and the second thing I wanted to say, I, I appreciate Eric what you said earlier, where the effects lasted longer. Uh, it's been a while, Eric, and uh, we 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 moved about a month ago, um, and um, and I had didn't have a chance to update you, Eric, but she she continues to progress, um, and now she's on to two to three words um, and four syllable four syllables. So the progression has continued. Um, uh, in, in her sense, sense the treatment and she finished, uh, finished around, um, the treatment for the first time she finished in, in April. Um, and so that wasn't too long ago. And that's, uh, that's all I have. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mason. Um, it's a little emotional. Mason's a friend and uh, his daughter's just a, a beautiful, wonderful, uh, child. And so to see these kind of changes is uh, tremendous. Um, but we want to share a bit of the science, the background science uh, that we were able to observe. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Alice to talk about uh, her EEGs as well. So this is, uh, yeah, thank you, Mason. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I held back my emotions, Eric. I did a good job, I thought, being a scientist, being a doctor. <laughs> so this was uh, the, the baseline EEG. You can see here that uh, there's, there's a peak posteriorly at about four and one under eight at about seven and a half. Uh, we're finding with some developmental delay cases that they, they don't develop uh, alpha activity. The, the frequency uh, doesn't even emerge past eight hertz. And that's something just to keep in mind for this case. But we can see similarly, uh, same frequencies, four and eight, although they're, they're quite small in this EEG uh, at baseline. And Eleanor uh, went ahead and, and went through two months, I, I believe, of, of this daily stimulation. And we can see uh, that this is after one month that uh, we took the baseline EEG and we waited before commencing therapy until uh, about uh, June, uh, mid-May, June. Uh, so this is after one month here and, and this is after uh, approximately two. And we can see that from baseline to more recent uh, EEGs that there's been uh, quite a, a large emergence of both rhythms. Uh, prominent four hertz is, is quite high following the intervention therapy, but uh, we can also see eight hertz or seven and a half starting to emerge. There's, there's no alpha rhythm that's emerged uh, yet. And that's not um, uncommon as we see in some of these uh, delays. However, the fact that we have such a large increase in, in cortical activity at the scalp uh, certainly points towards uh, possible mechanisms, including uh, long-term potentiation, improvement in cortical network synchrony, and all of these other uh, domain factors that are normally disrupted in, in the autism spectrum domain of, of uh, EEG and, and cortical functional signatures. So uh, just with that, it, it's so uh, endearing to be able to uh, you know, work with, with this case. And, and Mason, thank you for being on. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up for, for questions and discussion. But before, before we open up for uh, dialogue, I just want to share that the story is not quite over yet. Um, Mason is, is just love of a father and the momentum uh, from this case. Uh, we've actually uh, gotten IRB approval to do a, uh, a small trial because it's just exquisitely rare. Um, it's a chromosome 9 deletion. And so getting recruitment for these types of studies is, is a bit challenging, but uh, the cleaster of the National Center of Excellence is at Boston Children's Hospital, and uh, Dr. Alex Colazon will be the, the principal investigator. We've designed a trial. We're currently rallying funding to do that trial, and uh, we're hoping uh, that'll launch in 2022. We're also looking to build upon our uh, pilot data and to do a multi-center, uh, large pivotal trial uh, for autism spectrum disorder. So, so we're really working hard to advance the science and uh, just honored to be here with all of you uh, as part of this discussion. And um, from there, we can open it up to discussion. Thanks. Thanks, uh, gentlemen, and congratulations. I mean, it's really remarkable um, what you just showed. And, and if, that's, if, the, if that's predictive of where this is headed, it's going to be, a, it could be really, really significant. So um, 
best wishes on that. Um, a couple of questions here really quick before we move to the, the final presentation. Um, one is, um, how do you handle doing EEG with your eyes closed, quiet, sort of with an autism population and do you sedate them? Uh, just trying to pick, there's a question around how that operationally works. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that. There's no sedation. Uh, the technicians who are, are doing this have been, been trained and gone through a vetted process that requires hours and hours and hours of, of, of training. It's very difficult to uh, put a cap on a, the, the head of a child with autism to get them to close their eyes where you have to use cotton swabs. There's a lot of patients involved and uh, the EEGs themselves can take multiple sessions before we get something that's clean, but they, they work cooperatively with the family. They send the caps home with the parents in order to habituate the, the children to the test. Um, there's a lot of effort required in order to get something that's clean. And, and even if we're unable to get something that's clean, the family may uh, be informed that the visualization on the data might be a little bit uh, less ideal, but you can still uh, calculate uh, a method for therapy regardless. So, um, you know, that's closely handled with the family and with an excellent team of uh, EG specialists um, in, in all the areas where this is being practiced. Great, thanks. And, and um, <clears throat> sounds analogous to some of the challenges that, that we've seen in getting good MRI uh, data in, in kids with autism. Um, but uh, one question I had was, um, so, so far what you showed was this treatment as a standalone um, and the response times are pretty quick. So would you expect maybe even either a more pronounced effect or no synergy between that and say ABA going on at the same time or other intervention going on at the same time? And I guess embedded in that is how would you, how would you do those trials? Maybe that's a longer term question that we, we could take offline. <laughs> Well, I would say we strongly encourage uh, families to continue with ABA therapy. We view this as complementary. Uh, it's very much a team approach. And uh, we've seen tremendous progress with uh, uh, families who do ABA. And we view this as kind of synergistic. Um, how we tease that out in a clinical trial, that, that, that is a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, we want to see in isolation what the therapeutic benefit, yep. the safety and the efficacy of this treatment would be in isolation. But in practice, you know, our oath and our mission, of course, is to serve our patients in the best manner possible. And we believe that the, the multimodal team approach is going to be the best uh, for each family. Um, but uh, yeah, Mason, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that either uh, in terms of Eleanor's. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we kept Eleanor in all therapies at all times uh, during, during the treatment. And yeah, yeah, coming from, you know, I won't say anything else. Yes, yes and yes. Okay, great, great. So. Again, thanks, bravo, guys, and and uh, I think we there are a couple of other questions there if you don't mind.